Well, welcome uh, to the session. Um, there should have been a video <laughs> that told you the following. Welcome to Starts Day. So FBM is partner of um, the Starts Prize, which is an EU prize um, for science, technology, and the arts. It's an award for innovative projects in this field. And um, Sophie Gran Turismo, the topic we're going to talk about more and hear about more, um, has been nominated for the prize this year. So GT Sophie is a superhuman autonomous AI racing agent that has mastered the hyper-realistic PlayStation 4 game Gran Turismo Sport at a world championship level. Now, there are already 10 questions in that one <laughs> sentence that I'm going to ask you later. Sure. Um, Chiti Sophie was trained utilizing deep reinforcement learning techniques developed by Sony AI. And from Sony AI, we welcome um, Kaushik Subramanian, as he's a senior research scientist um, at Sony AI, working on the flagship gaming project. And before joining Sony, you were at Cogitai That's Inc. Right. And you received your PhD in 2017 from Georgia Institute of Technology, working on human in the loop system and reinforcement learning. Again, 10 questions I have. Um, your research spans algorithm for intelligent decision making and interactive learning. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Awesome. And I think you're starting with a presentation That's right. on your work, right? Yes. So thank you so it. much. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And thank you. And uh, to like, I want to thank you for inviting me here. So um, right, I'm going to give you some insights into the work that we put in to develop this, um, this agent that we call Gran Turismo Sophie. And uh, we have a big group of people who worked on this project, and I'm going to try to describe some of the elements of, of what we did to reach our, to reach our goal. Uh, but to get started, I'd like to sort of you know, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the group that uh, sort of went into this project. So our group at Sony AI um, has this mission where we want to think about ways uh, of using AI techniques to unleash uh, human imagination and creativity. So there are a lot of us who have a different, you know, different tasks, who do different jobs, are there ways in which AI could be useful for us, specifically to allow us to be more creative and more imaginative in the tasks um, that we do? And so our group at Sony AI is interested in what are the AI methods that can help um, in that goal towards that, towards, towards reaching that, um, that goal. And so we want to make sure that it not just, you know, in all aspects of society, we're able to, you know, help people uh, with, with AI techniques. Now, uh, to accomplish this goal, we have a wonderful workforce. Now the workforce is divided across the globe, which is pretty cool. We have a remote workforce in North America, and uh, we have offices in Tokyo and Zurich. So the cool thing about this setup is that uh, there's like a 24-hour work cycle. Nobody, there's always somebody who's awake who's working on something, even when I'm sleeping, which is which is pretty cool. So uh, the fact that there's always somebody working means that we can make progress reasonably fast. And uh, in Sony AI, there are four flagship projects. Um, as, as you mentioned, one of them is gaming, the one that I will be talking to you about. But I do also want to mention three others. Uh, one is called gastronomy, uh, and one is called imaging and sensing. And at the heart of this image that you see here is AI ethics. Uh, and that's something that's very important for us, because any AI project that you do, you want to make sure that it falls within ethical boundaries that humans we have decided. And so it doesn't sort of you know, break any, any big privacy laws, and it's ethical. Uh, and so that sort of is important for any project that we work on, and that's why it's at the heart of, of these flagship projects. Uh, the work that I will describe, uh, of course, is, is a big collaboration. Um, so there's Sony AI, which I represent, <coughs> and there is uh, the game makers uh, for Gran Turismo. So that is Polyphony Digital, the company that actually made the game, and Sony Interactive Entertainment. That, provided us with, I want to say, roughly 2,000 PlayStations um, to allow us to train this, this, um, this Gran Turismo Sophie. So 2,000 PlayStations is a lot. I have one at home. So just kind of think about they have these rooms that are filled with these PlayStations to allow us to, to meet this goal. Right, so just a quick background of that. Maybe just to get started, maybe I was curious here if anybody in the room has actually played Gran Turismo. Um, anybody here? One, two, three. Awesome, awesome, great. So. Uh, Gran Turismo is, is uh, basically a realistic driving simulator, um, the idea being that it's trying to capture automobile racing in the most realistic way possible. And so things like car rider dynamics, slipstream effects, you know, tire friction, slipstream, so on and so forth. It's trying to capture those you know, real-world effects in the most realistic way possible, and it does a really good job of it. 
and there are esports. It's it's a platform where you have racers <laughs> go in and participate in competitive races. And so, for example, it's actually used by professional drivers um, in the 2022 Virtual Olympics as well. So the game is not something just that I play at home. It's used on a very large level, on a competitive level, importantly, where people actually compete to do well um, and you know perhaps make it into real world racing as well. And the reason being uh, that the game is so realistic means that it poses some very interesting challenges. So to race in this game, very similar to racing in the real world, you have to think about how the car works, how do you drive around a sort of specific track in the best way possible, how do you compete with other races, there are a lot of things to account for. And I think the best example that you can have is things like Formula One. When you think, watch those races, there are a lot of like strategic elements that go into that. And so some of those actually come up here as well. And our team at Sony AI, we thought, all right, you know, there is this wonderful domain, Gran Turismo. Um, it's actually trying to capture real world racing in a, in a pretty cool way. What are the AI challenges that could come up when you think about a domain like this? And so, of course, we're going to set ourselves big challenges. And what we decided to do uh, was to set ourselves this grand challenge where we say, all right, let's choose the best racers in the world in this game. We're going to now develop an AI racing car that can ideally beat them uh, or, or compete with them and maybe outrace them um, in the game. So these are players who are really good at the game. They're really fast. They know how to race. They've been playing for many years, and they are the world's best. And we want to develop an AI agent that can ideally compete with them and perhaps even, even outrace them. Now, the image shows uh, three different tracks. So these are tracks that are in the game, Seaside, uh, Dragon Trail Seaside, um, Lago Maggiore, and Circuit de la Sarte. Now, each track has different characteristics. Um, so for example, the Circuit de la Sarte is the home of the 24-hour Le Mans race, if people are familiar with that. It's a long track, and it allows for some very interesting racing techniques. That car that you see in that image there is actually, it can go up to 300 kilometers an hour, which is like roughly like a Formula One car. So when you have cars at different speeds, there are different dynamics that you have to account for. And similarly, if you look at the race one over there, it's basically a road car on a, on a reasonably straightforward flat track. And so the idea here was that each of these races, <coughs> race one to three, is going to be on different types of tracks with different cars, pose their own unique challenges. And the four players that you see at the bottom um, are some of the world's best. Now, this was done during, um, during the pandemic time, so travel was limited. And so the game makers are originally from, from Tokyo. And so there were racers there who were gracious enough to offer their time to help us. And those are the four racers in the bottom. So they are, they are really good um, at playing this game. And maybe just to kind of maybe dive into what we did to accomplish this goal, um, as you would probably imagine that in order to race well, uh, there are a couple of things that you want to account for. First one being you want to drive fast, right? Essentially, you want to be the fastest one in the track. Second thing is you want to learn how how to like, drive around other cars. So there are things like racing tactics. You want to be able to overtake them. You want to make sure that you can defend your position. So this is not just you alone. This is a, com a combination of you and another car, and other cars even. And the last one is this idea of racing etiquette. Now, this is something that perhaps was maybe the biggest challenge for us, um, the idea being that you have to have um, the cars respect racing rules and the racing etiquette. And these are highly imprecise elements. There's often a human steward who subjectively classifies things, uh, but I will, I will get into it a bit later. But I just want to specify that these are three things that you would want your AI car to, to basically learn about in order to race well um, in these games. So it's not just going fast. There are a couple of other elements um, as well. And um, maybe some of you have heard of these topics. So maybe some of you haven't. But let me give you a quick version of this. So the idea, uh, the approach that we take is largely referred to as reinforcement learning. There are a lot of details in this space. But for now, I'm just going to keep it at a very high level. The one way I like to often think about it is it's very similar to how, uh, how I live my life. I imagine how other people also live their life uh, in that there is an environment that we live in, let's say the world. And in that world, uh, there's something that describes the world, things like how fast is the car going, you know, the position of these cars, things like friction, all of that. So there's something that captures how, what configuration the world is in. And there are some things that I do that lead to positive outcomes, and there are some things that I do that lead to negative outcomes. And that's what that reward represents. So if I drive fast, <laughs> uh, I'm going to get a positive reward. If I collide with another car, I'm going to get a negative reward. And so essentially, if I do good things, good things are likely to happen in the future. If I do bad things, that's something that I want to avoid. And so all of those are input to me, which is the AI agent, or in this case, the car. And so I'm going to basically take actions. Um, for the car, you would imagine actions are things like driving, accelerating, braking, 
training. Those are the basic actions that you would have. And so we, we go through this loop, and the goal is that every time we complete this loop, the actions that the AI car selects ideally puts it in a winning position. Now, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about when you want to think about racing, what are the things that the car needs to know about? Like the car needs to know about itself. It needs to know how fast it's going. It needs to know its velocity, its acceleration, uh, which is what typically I know when I'm driving my regular car. But when, you, when it comes to racing, there are other elements that you also want to know. You want to know things like the load on the tires. You want to know if the tires are slipping and so on. So all of these elements are available to us in the game. And uh, we, we provide that as information for the AI agent as well. And so this image is basically capturing the different elements that the car would have to know about in order for it to, to sort of learn about itself. Now, there is also this element of the car needs to know the track that it is on. And that's what the picture here is capturing. So there is uh, an image of the track. And you see those purple sort of dashed points there. And that gives you a sense of what part of the track is the car familiar with? So I'm just going to play this quick video. So as the car is moving on this track, you're going to see the purple dots sort of move ahead. And so what that's essentially telling you is that the car has some information about what's coming ahead. And that's what those purple dots capture. Now, if you look very closely, there's a sharp turn that's coming up. You will notice the purple dots sort of you know, don't extend out too far. And the reason for that is because the car is slowing down, like right here. The purple dots become very close. It means that the car is slowing down. So it has to be very careful about the track spacing at that point. And so now at this stage, the car knows a little bit about itself. It knows a little bit about the track that it's on. What happens if you put this together? So now, uh, time trial is basically the idea that there's a car just by itself, and it's trying to get the fastest time. That's what a time trial is. There's no other opponent um, in this space. Now, if you take reinforcement learning, you take car features, and you take things about the track, and you take PlayStations, and you sort of run your learning algorithm. This is what you're going to see. After four hours, the car knows how to go around the track. After eight hours, it is just about as good as the AI that's built into the game. And after 24 hours, it is better than, I want to say, 90% of the humans in the world, just after 24 hours. So after a day, I have an AI car that can beat 90% of the people in the world. What about that last 10%? To get there, it takes me an additional seven days, where I'm basically taking off seconds, even milliseconds at that point, to get to that level where I can beat the world's best. And so like I said there, um, these are trained for roughly eight to 10 days on 10 PlayStation. So what that means for us is it, it roughly corresponds to about one to two years of human racing time. And if you look at the sort of histogram at the bottom there, what that's showing you is if you take your, your best learned outcome, your, your agent, um, and you run that a couple of times, the, the orange bars show you how fast those lap times are. Of course, the goal here is to be more to the left as much as possible. Uh, and the numbers there, one, two, three, four, are the best human times that you have over there. So what you want to see is you want to be far away from the numbered ones. You want the orange bars to be far away from them. And so what we can see here is that our car from the orange bars has a lower time than the person, which is great, but it takes us eight days to get there. Now, often, you know, when I look at these results, I'm like, all right, what did the AI car do that allowed it to be this fast? And so I think this video, uh, I think, captures that pretty well. I'm not sure if there should be audio for this. No? OK. <clears throat> I want to draw attention to a turn um, that's coming up in a few seconds, right about now. Now, if I were to take that turn, there's a good 90% chance that I'm going to hit those barriers when I do that turn. The fact that the AI car has amazing control and it's able to take that turn as well as it did gives it that advantage where it says, OK, I have really good control over the cars compared to a person like me. Now, I'm not really good at the game, so I should not use myself as a comparison. But even if you take the best drivers, um, it does that really, really well, and importantly, consistently. So it's not just that it does it well once. It does it well on a, on a number of times. So what we did, we said, all right, let's ask like, you know, professional racers to you know, watch these cars and, and comment on, on how well uh, they perform. And so um, basically, the, what the image here shows is that if you take a track and you ask yourself, which parts of the track is the AI better? Understandably, what you're going to see is that it's basically better at the turns. On the straights, everyone's accelerating. There's, there's nothing much you can do different over there, but at the turns, the AI car has a much better entry and a much better exit. And that's where you basically see the AI car has an advantage. Now I want to show a quick, uh, oh, this one definitely has audio.
Is there any way? No? But <laughs> it's useful because there's a the person is comment commentating um, in the background, so it's useful to know that. All right, anyway, while, while that's being worked out, I will, I will go ahead. Um, no? All right. Um, OK, uh, let's see here. So basically what the person, uh, let me try to rewind a bit if I can. Cool, all right. So um, it might be hard to see from the video, but essentially, the person whose view you have is a human driver, and there's a car in front, which is basically the AI car. And um, if the audio were there, what you would basically hear him saying is that um, the car is driving in a way that he just could not be, would not be able to reproduce, uh, meaning that the car has some amazing control that he had not even considered um, if, he would be, if he would be racing. And so it was, it was basically cool to get that positive sign from a human professional racer uh, watching our car perform, which was great. Now, as I said before, being faster isn't enough. There are a couple of other components that we need to account for. Um, important one being um, racing tactics and racing etiquette. And so uh, if you think about Formula One, of course, you want the drivers to go fast and get the fastest laps, but you also want things like tactics, where you want to learn how to you know, make a pass on another car. You want to know how to defend your position. And so what this image here is capturing is that there are different parts of the track, but there are different skills that are important. And so each of these images is basically showing us that, all right, there are some parts of the track where you're by yourself. So what I'm going to call 1v0, it's just me by myself. Uh, there are other parts of the track where I have three cars around me, or 1v3. And so what we do when we train our AI car is to basically launch the car in different positions with different types of opponents around it, with a different number of opponents around it. And so the idea being that this would give it different kinds of experiences to allow it to learn, how do I overtake one car? How do I overtake two cars? And so on. And so we did this on all the three tracks to learn racing tactics, uh, which I will show you later it did. Uh, what about racing etiquette? Now, this was, I, I alluded to a little bit in the beginning, one of the biggest challenges for us, which is that we were able to go fast, we were able to learn tactics, but how do you learn to drive in a way that someone would characterize as you know, uh, a good sportsman, right? The idea that the, it's very unspecified, it's like there's always a human steward who's watching these races who says, ah, okay, this thing that you did, you collided with another car, and two seconds later, this thing happened, and that's why you got like a penalty. Now, that's a very complicated system because it's not just contact, it's the result of the contact that happened a couple of seconds later. And so uh, this is not easy for AI systems to learn about. We, we took a first pass at it, and what this image is showing is that there are different ways in which you can collide with a car. You can basically sort of you know, rear end them. You can collide with them on turns. We tried to classify a diff few different variations, and we finally have something um, that I think we are pretty, pretty happy with. And so let's go back to this challenge uh, that I posed. We have a car that can drive fast. We have a car that can learn tactics, and ideally a car uh, that knows something about racing etiquette. So we said, we called these people in to the studio. We said, you guys are really good. Let's you know, race against you to see, um, to see how we can do. We did this race in July and in October, as you can see. And I'm going to show you a few videos um, of that. So this is um, the, race, the first race of Dragon Trail Seaside. Uh, just to give you a quick sense of the starting positions, you have eight cars in a race, four humans and four AI, and they are um, interchangeable, so meaning that the first one, three, five, and seven are AI cars, two, four, six, eight are um, the human cars. So I'm just going to quickly play this. So yeah, three, two, one, the race starts. Um, the, any car that says Sophie is basically the AI car. You can see, you can see that with like the, the colors there. And the, the other human cars um, are the white cars. So you will see us in positions one and three. But right after the first turn, uh, you're going to see something, something pretty cool happen, which is that we are able to overtake uh, that person and now are in second place. Now, I should give you some context here, uh, because this is a race that happened in Japan. The whole Sony AI team is on like a Zoom call watching this trying to basically you know, beat the world's best players. And the fact that we were able to do this right at the first turn, if only I could explain how happy I was to actually see this happen, because for me, it was always sort of watching sort of you know, tests that we did. But to actually see this happen live was absolutely unbelievable. Of course, at that time, there's nothing you can do. If you lose, you lose. But like to watch this happen on the first turn was great. Uh, and I will add that we started 1, 3, 5, 7. We finished 1, 2, 4, 5. 
So we had to we squeezed in a human in third place. Unfortunate, but fine, it's okay. They can have the third place if they want. Uh, this is the second race that we did, um, the Lago Maggiore, and I think I want to show some really cool maneuver that the AI um, technique learned. I'm going to try to play both these videos at the same time. Um, you're going to notice the, the green and the gray cars are the AI cars. And right after this turn, both cars who are at the back are now ahead. So the fact that there is what we call a double pass is something that you don't often see um, in real world racing. You often don't see it in, in, in Gran Turismo as well. Uh, but the fact that you have this, this version where, uh, you know, we were, the two AI cars were at the back and were able to get around these two human cars at the same time was, was pretty incredible for us. And so seeing these moments, we were able to learn that, all right, the AI is learning something that puts it in a unique, um, you know, pretty strong position. And um, let, me go, let me go to actually tell you what the results were. So at the end, um, I did mention in the beginning that we did this race in July and October. What I did not mention is that we did not win in July. So oftentimes when you hear these stories, uh, it's not always a success in the first attempt. So we had a race with them in July where they actually beat us. Right? And so you can see from here, each race has a, a point system associated with it. And from the points, uh, we basically maybe lost the first race, we won the second race, but then they won the third race. And when you tally it up, uh, they beat us at the end. Uh, I think they were quite happy with it. And of course, we were totally, um, totally sort of sad with the result. However, we said, all right, we have some time to basically review the results to see what happened. And we said, all right, challenge accepted. Three months later, we're going to come back and we're going to basically do as well as we can. And we're going to do well enough that we double the points that the human players had, uh, which was pretty incredible for us. So we beat them on every race. And at the end, uh, we just basically had twice the points that they had, uh, which was pretty cool. At this point, as it stands, I think uh, there is no human racer who is faster than GT Sophie, which is cool. And when you have a result like that, what that allows you to do is to publish this work in very strong, compelling um, scientific journals. So this work was on the cover of the Nature Journal, uh, which we are very happy about, and uh, Outracing Champion Gran Turismo Drivers with GP Reinforcement Learning. Now, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of authors there, uh, which, is, which is cool because we have a global team that's, that's working um, on this. I want to quickly maybe show uh, some, some testimonies, which I think are relevant here. When we have cars that can drive that fast, you know, it's cool to see it, but then it's also interesting to hear about what people think uh, when they watch these, uh, these AI cars operate. So what you can see here are some statements from the, the drivers from Japan, uh, uh, a driver from Italy, from uh, Valerio Gallo. And I think what's, what I want to sort of call to attention here is uh, the line where Valerio says, um, the ghost is always a reference. Uh, even when I train, I always use someone else's ghost to improve. Uh, in this case, you have a very fast ghost, so the ghost here being the AI car. And uh, even though I wasn't getting close to my limits, uh, even though I wasn't getting close to it, I was getting closer to my limits. And what that is probably goes back to the mission statement, which is that we want people to enhance their experience. We want people to get to their limits using AI techniques. And when you watch a car sort of operate the way it does, you're like, ah, okay, I can learn something from this and I can be a better racer. Uh, I'm gonna play this video, which did not work. Okay. Did, we didn't want to. We had some computer problems, and we didn't want to restart the computer, which we would have. I see. To, but um, we didn't want to do it in the middle of the presentation. Okay. Unless it's completely frozen, then we have to restart it anyway. Sure, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I'm fine. Um, we can restart. Let me, let me just uh, basically tell you that the next couple of slides was just giving you uh, a pictures of all members of the team because it's very important to know that it wasn't just me. Even though I am here talking about it, there were about 20, 25 people working on this uh, in different parts of the world. So it was a, a wonderful global effort to get there, and uh, there are a lot of interesting approaches that we're thinking about as terms of next steps, um, making Gran Turismo Sophie accessible to the public, because it's not just us at Sony AI. We would like to make this AI car accessible um, in different ways to people. And um, the fact that we have a, a publication with this also allows us to you know, expose these techniques to the research community as well, which we are also very thrilled about. And so um, having said that, I will maybe stop there. If the video comes back, I can show it later, but um, I'm happy to stop there for now.
Thank you very much, Pasek. Uh, Thank you. Ähm, für die Technik, falls, falls es noch klappt, weiterzuschalten, gerne machen, weil dann kann er die restlichen Slides noch zeigen. Ansonsten, we start talking. Sure. Actually, because Let's I have so it. many questions, as I said before. Um, we, we saw two reactions of, of fans um, or of players, other players, right? But how did fans of Gran Turismo actually react to it? Did they like it or, or were they like saying, what are you guys, why are you guys fucking with our game? I will be honest. I think it's a combination of both uh, because I feel like um, there is a sense of watching this AI car do as well as it does and marvel at it, which is to say, ah, it's cool that you can drive this fast. Uh, but then the follow-up question is to every human player, which is, oh, can I learn from this? Can I watch this AI car and learn from it? You've, you've shown me some examples for it, but, but I would like to sort of you know, play with it in the house. I would like to become more familiar with it. So I think there is uh, a sense of maybe anticipation from fans, mm -hmm. which is to say, all right, you've shown us this cool tech, How do we get it to the house? How do you make sure that I can you know, become a better racer at this? That was one side of it. I think the other side of it is often the fact that uh, there are questions that come up, which is, can the human player do what the car is doing? You know, if I watch the car drive as well as it does, like for the example that I showed you where the car goes very close to the, to the chicanes, to the walls, uh, would a human player be able to do this? Now, I honestly don't know, because right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to tell people this is possible, so you should try to do it. Because in the past, people hadn't even tried it. So maybe a year from now, I can come back and I can say, yes, it's possible because people have tried, or no, it's not, people tried and they failed. So I don't have an answer to that, but I'm hoping that when people watch this, they can come back to us and say, I became a better racer just because by watching what GT Sophie did. So what's the hidden agenda for uh, Sony AI um, developing that project at all. Um, is Sony AI secretly trying to be the better Tesla? <laughs> uh, I often make this joke when I'm asked if this AI tech should be in a real car. No chance. It's, it should not at all be uh, in a real car, at least not in this form. Let me be clear about that. Um, I think to, to your point about um, the agenda here, our goal is um, when we actually does, you know, thought about the project, we said, all right, There is this domain, Gran Turismo, which offers some unique AI challenges. And that was our, basically our pull, which is to say, all right, there are some AI challenges there that existing methods don't perhaps solve completely. Is there a space for us to basically say, we can come up with something that can, that can you know, resolve some of these challenges? So our agenda is basically, you know, let's try to tackle some of these hard problems that existing research does not cover. There are things that can happen as a result of that, but first let's tackle that challenge. And now having said that, we are now in a position where we've solved the problem to a large extent. We would like to be able to use this and share this with other people. So I guess now that has become part of our agenda as well, which is solve the problem first, now make it accessible so that people can experience it themselves. So Kaushik, we just developed by chance a new um, moderation format here. It's called the sandwich format. You start with a presentation, then you have a set of questions, then you end with a presentation. Okay. Um, because I think the, um, <laughs> the computer is, has restarted, so we, right. can, we can follow up with that. But sure. I have another question in between. Um, what can other industries, like let's say the book industry, because after all we're at a book fair, what can we learn from that project? So for example, could Sony AI develop um, a superhuman reader, AI reader, who reads all our books, who learns to read all our books, and then decides what is boring, what is interesting, where to close the book and throw it away, which books to buy, which is the next bestseller, probably. So, how about that? Um, I think my, my, my response to that comment is going to be quite limited. And the main reason being that um, at least the, the group that I am part of is focused more on the gaming side of it. Now, there are games that, of course, have like, you know, text components in them. There are games that, you know, have that as well. And there are unique challenges in that space. And so perhaps my, my thought might be if we do end up working in that space, I can imagine AI techniques transfer from that game to examples that you give. I think at the moment, um, that space we haven't tapped in as yet, but if we did, I can imagine uh, that happening. Because for me, uh, the goal is that it's cool that we were able to do this, but we would like the research community to take this idea and apply it to other kinds of domains that they think 
are applicable as well. So it doesn't have to be limited to the game itself. And so I'm hoping that different types of games, we will learn different things that people can then go, all right, for books, for media, I'm going to use this technique because it's applicable. And we believe they are. Okay. So you also briefly mentioned um, the, the, the gaming etiquette. Um, there was kind of a big challenge for, um, for, for the AI. What did you learn for AI ethics um, in this project? So uh, when we collaborated uh, with that team, we wanted to make sure that uh, one of the, like a, I mean, a quick example here is that you, we would often watch human racers, um, you know, how they race in these games and try to learn from them. Like how do human racers respect the racing <coughs> etiquette? And are there lessons that we can take from them to our, to our, um, to our AI car? And so we, we had like, we wanted to make sure that uh, the ethical team um, that we had made sure that, all right, all the, the rules that we're following are consistent with what you would see in a regular competitive race that only involves humans. It doesn't have to be AI special. It has to be consistent. And so I think that was the main idea there, which is that you shouldn't make any new rules just because you're an AI system. You're playing in the game. You should follow the same rules that every human is following. And so our, you know, our restraint was that let's make sure that we don't you know, collide the other car in a specific way that only an AI car can do because that's just not allowed. And so that was a, a very important consideration for us. So could you imagine that, that AI can help us find new rules to, to actually cooperate better as, as humans? Because right now, as I understood it correctly, um, we just copy humans' rules, right? We, the AI learns how we operate. But I mean, we are in war and we're not treating each other nicely every time. So could AI help us to become better humans? Yes, I, that's the goal <laughs> of, of Sony AI, so I'm going to be very optimistic about that. <laughs> but let me maybe give an example here. Uh, we, when we tried this Sophie project, one of the starting points that we did was to say, why don't you watch, why don't we watch human racers and learn something from them and start with human racing as like a starting point, right? And we tried that approach, and what we saw was that the car was good, but it just wasn't as good as we wanted it to be. So important to note here is that we used human racing as a starting point. And then we said, all right, let's remove that first step. Let's just say the car has to learn by itself. There's no human data as input. The car is just by itself learning from scratch as you would imagine you're learning for the first time. So there's no human sort of input there. Now that car did really, really well. Now, of course, you can, you know, there's a, there's a nice sort of, uh, you know, subtext message there, which is if you don't learn from people, you can be better. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I think to your point that there are some advantages there where you, if you don't constrain the AI to certain rules that humans limit themselves to, there are new things that you can learn. Now, of course, the new things that can be then learned, you have to verify that those things are not, you know, breaking any rules. But there are, there are certain advantages to not having human constraints in the learning process because humans have a lot of bias um, in the way we approach the world. And we want AI systems to, in some cases, use, you know, incorporate that bias, but in many cases, learn it without that bias and then you know, see what comes out of it. So I wanted to also ask you um, what kind of team you need. And I think that was the next part in your, yes. in your presentation. Right. And if I understood that correctly, we can start with the second part of the presentation. Stimmt das? Frage an die Technik. Here we go. Should I try? Uh, we'll try, just a second. Yep. Cool. Cool. Yeah, so uh, this is just uh, pictures of the different team members. Um, I, I think I'm the first, fifth person um, in that image, but uh, the first person is Pete Werman. Uh, he's the one who's the director uh, of the project, and so he led everybody else um, in this group. The um, four people at the end uh, are the executives in the team. Uh, so the last person is basically the um, CEO of Sony AI, uh, but Pete Werman, the first person in the picture, um, directed us to, to accomplish um, this goal. So, and these people are in America, in, in Europe, in Japan. So um, as I said, a wonderful global experience to, to get there. Maybe, um, I'm not sure if the video is going to play this time. Let me try it. Oops. Yeah. But there is no audio. All right. I guess that problem is not solved. All right. No worries. <laughs> um, we should get like, how much was it? 2,000 PlayStations? Yes. 2,000 PlayStations that are being used um, to give us training time. And like I said, eight to 10 days, 2,000 PlayStations. 
that's a lot of human racing time. Yeah. And so one to two years of human racing time is, is how much you need to be really good at this game. We would need like 10 of I there, would need a lot more, <laughs> I, I suspect, because I should say I'm not an expert in this game. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty good at, at you know, coming up with, with developing Gran Turismo Sophie, but I'm not really good at the game. So the AI should not watch me uh, when it wants to learn how to drive fast. So what are the next steps? Now you have GT Sophie. Right. Um, what now? Yeah, so um, for people who are familiar, right now there's a, um, the most recent version of the game called Gran Turismo 7. Um, Gran Turismo 7, of course, has um, an AI built into the game, uh, but we would like to make our AI, like I said, in the game, <coughs> accessible to other people. And so as a next step, we are looking for ways in which we can do that. That's, of course, ongoing work. There's not much um, I would be able to say about that, but the, the grand goal, of course, is to transfer the AI technology from the research house to the end user and, and you know, make it in a way where we can enhance their experience. So and that's the goal we're actively working on at the moment. Okay, and um, I mean, of course, since Sony is involved, it's about the PlayStation, but could you imagine developing for other platforms as well? Um, that would not be us, I believe. I believe our, our um, access would be primarily to Sony's PlayStation, so Sony publishers. Uh, but like I said before, there is, there's nothing stopping people from saying these AI techniques apply to other games from other companies, and people are more than welcome to do that. And in fact, we believe that these AI techniques, in fact, the one that goes into this game, is applicable across other kinds of, of games as well. So um, it would not be us doing it, but we, the research is there for people to use um, as they think is, is okay. useful for them. So I think we should open up for questions in the room, if there are any. There is one, and there's a microphone coming up. Just a second. Third row. Hi, thanks for the presentation. My name is Tiberius Ignat. I'm coming from the research world, from research culture. And I have two questions I'll start with first. Uh, so you said you developed a, a car, an AI for a car that it hasn't been fed by humans, so it didn't learn. So for, for that car, I'd like to ask, how much curious was, was that car? In, in terms of, we know that AI is speaking, more, it's speaking the most likely to be successful mm -hmm. routes mm -hmm. and choices. Mm -hmm. But what about the importance of being curious yeah. and picking choices that are not so most likely to be successful, so less likely, and how less likely, yeah. and how you randomized the, uh, the, the choices in which to pick these risks, let's say, mm -hmm. if you see a sense in that lack of curiosity, low level of curiosity, this is, um, this is one question. And the second question is about, you said that uh, Gran Turismo 7 has AI built in. Yeah. And it's about what is called in our world research ethics. Did you, it, do you give a choice for players to choose not to feed your AI if they want, if they don't want to, to feed it? Do they take? Do you take consent from each player? Do you give the players the choice to say, "I don't want to feed your AI system"? Got it. Okay. Two questions. Cool. Um, to the first question, which is a really cool question. Uh, how curious is the AI car? Now, in the learning process, um, like I said, there's no human input here, so meaning that the car has to learn about driving by itself. And so the learning algorithm, which I said reinforcement learning, um, has a level of what I would like to call exploration, which is that it has to try a few different things. It has to maybe steer here, accelerate there, brake here, and it has to be curious in that way to learn what the best way to drive is. Now all the curiosity that it has is towards driving as well as possible. So I should say that there is a lot of curiosity at the beginning because it doesn't know how to drive, but after it learns how to drive, after four hours, after eight hours, after 24 <coughs> hours, when it knows how to drive really well, the range of curiosity goes down because it knows this is what I need to do to drive fast. There are some minute changes. Like I mentioned, it takes seven days to, to build off, like shave off milliseconds. The curiosity is very limited at that point because you're now maybe just a little turn here, a little acceleration there, that's basically what you need. And at the end of the day, the AI car is not gonna be, it's, it's designed to be the best that it can. And so the curiosity is, is, is going down as the learning goes on because 
ideally it's learning how to drive as well as possible. Now to the second question about user experience, um, we have the, built, the AI that's built into the game uh, that's going to drive uh, the way it does. Uh, we are thinking about ways in which we can incorporate our GT Sophie into the game. Now, whether it's going to be, you know, an option for players to select from, whether it's going to be something that um, that's sort of, you know, always there in the game. That's something that the game developers uh, will sort of also have to weigh on because we will, of course, provide GT Sophie, Gran Turismo Sophie, but the game developers have to think about the narrative that comes around that. And so uh, we will work with them. There's, there's little that I can say about that just because there's some ongoing work in that direction, which is how do we expose this AI to human players to make them sort of have fun with it. So. Further questions from the audience? There's one over there. Hi. Um, so you talked a little bit about how the AI is going to be used in the future and how it's going to be added to possibly more games. However, there are constantly new games coming out and as the gaming world constantly evolves with the new technologies. So how are you going to apply GT Sophie to other uh, games or concepts or even different technologies such as like VR maybe. Great, yeah. Um, so many ways to, to, to think about that. There are, there are a lot of new games. There's, there are new games coming up so often. I, what I find pretty cool is that in each of these games, like even the VR tech, there are different ways of, like, that people have to experience and like, have fun in these games. And I think for us, uh, I would say that the, the primary motivation when we you know, think about a game to work on is what are the open sort of scientific challenges in that. So if you think about Gran Turismo, of course, it's like racing elements, but there are other games uh, that have other unique challenges as well. So when we think about the next game to work on or other games to work on, that will be at the forefront of, of our sort of selection process, which is what are the challenges that remain that people haven't tackled that these games offer us to tackle. So that's going to be the one sort of main driving point. And the second thing then is, how can we, if we were to solve this problem, does that enhance end user experience, right? So if at the end of it, we solve a scientific goal and it's not going to help anybody, it's less motivating. But if we're able to do something that can then go back to the end user, go back to me at home, where I then load up the game and I'm able to have more fun, or I'm able to become better at the game, that'll be, that'll be great. Now, VR specifically, there's not, there's not much I can, I mean, can comment on that. That's, basi that's basically a way to experience the game. Our methodology is more directly engaging in the game space itself. And so as new games come up, there's always going to be someone at Sony AI thinking about, all right, there's this new game. It falls in this specific genre. Uh, these are the challenges that it has. Can we do something to, to sort of work and, and you know, resolve that? And so. Uh, I would say there's a lot of wedding that goes into it, and that's something that we are currently looking at as well. More questions? One, last row. Hi, I'm curious to um, understand a little bit more if your team took in the perhaps challenge of diversity from the very beginning, since Sophie is built on reinforcement learning and eventually to the end user. So if it's not tackled in the beginning, do you find that then it loops um, towards the, the end and therefore diversity wasn't taken into account? Like how did you tackle that challenge? Perhaps can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on what you mean when you say diversity in this, in this example? Sure, uh, so I noticed just your team mm -hmm. has just an example, right? Like not as many women. Mm -hmm. And the four racers that you use also didn't have women. Right. Now, this isn't just like a gender or race thing, but just diversity in general right. question. For sure. And I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I will say that it is uh, uh, an absolute priority for us at Sony AI to make sure that uh, the the, like we encourage people to sort of have different perspectives and diverse backgrounds, and so that is something that we often account for when we you know, reach out to people to have people join our team. That's something that we we actively consider. Now, even though uh, this image, uh, as you said, you know the the diversity, uh, you, you one can see that it's in a specific direction. Uh, there are like difficult times that people were going through here just because of the of the pandemic. And so um, as sort of the, the world opens up a little bit more, 
our goal is to actively make sure that um, the group is uh, you know, as diverse as, as is possible for us. Um, also making sure that we have all the skills that we need to form a good AI team. Now, to the point raised about the drivers um, as well, that was a, uh, they're nothing, I mean, they are really good at what they do. Um, I will also add that there were location constraints there. And so we had another race, um, maybe some of you are familiar with, in, in Salzburg, Austria, um, in July this year, which had people you know, from all over the world, not specifically from Japan. And there, there was a more um, sort of um, diverse group that was involved. And so uh, we are definitely not solving the problem, but we are going to try to make sure that it's something on our minds that we want to you know, make sure that we can equalize and get there as soon as possible. So I should say that we are very aware of it, and we want to uh, resolve that as soon as possible and take active steps towards it, because it's not going to happen on its own. More questions from the audience? No? OK. Then, Kaushik, thank you very much sure for joining us today. Thank you.